Coming up this week on Sports Pause, the women's basketball team had its second run in the NCAA tournament this weekend against Oklahoma. And shifting over to the ice, the men's hockey team played in its third straight ECAC semifinal in Lake Placid against Harvard. And the spring sports season is fully underway with men's lacrosse picking up its second victory of the year while the baseball team added its first tally to the win column. All that and more coming up next on Sports Pause. Hello and welcome to Sports Pause. It's been an action-packed weekend here in Hamden and we've got all the coverage you need. I'm Victoria Tigliano. And I'm Mark Spillane. Victoria, let's begin with the biggest story of them all, women's basketball in the national tournament. The 12th seeded Quinnipiac Bobcats traveled to Stanford, California to play the 5th seeded Oklahoma Sooners in a highly anticipated first round matchup. And the Sooners came ready to play as they defeated the Bobcats 111-84, to powered by six double-digit scores, including three off their bench. Gabby Ortiz led the way with 16 points as the Sooners shot almost 56% from the field. The Bobcats were led by Jasmine Martin's 24 points after falling behind 16-3, to however, to begin the game, Quinnipiac just couldn't recover. And it was an emotional ending to a terrific season for the Bobcats. They got off to a hot start. I know 10 minutes into the game, five minutes into the game, they were shooting 80% from the floor and uh, just ran into a, a buzzsaw. And credit to Sherry and her team. They were, they were ready to go. I, I believe we were ready to go. And we had a lot of fight in us for 40 minutes and able in that second half to get it to 11 out of a timeout, get a turnover uh, and not capitalize and get it into uh, under double digit digits uh, in the second half. But um, I think, you know, they were a very fast-paced team, and we haven't played a team that fast since Notre Dame. And the same exact thing happened when we played them. And I think, you know, once we actually did get, like, accustomed to the speed of, that they were, you know, we were able to adjust. And we were, you know, after the 19-5 lead, we were able to go back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, we just hit a couple of shots. I mean, Jasmine and I on the way here were just talking about what we've done through the years and you know Mountain said it best we have some trophies in our trophy case that no one can take away from us um, I think you know we're so upset because we knew we could beat this team and um, you have to credit them they shot the lights out of the gym they were just on fire and they had a great uh, post presence but I think looking back at what we've done um, I can't be more proud of my team and you know our coaches that helped us get to this point believed in every single one of us probably more than we believe in ourselves so I mean, just what Jazz said, put Quinnipiac on the map. Hopefully more people can pronounce our name and know where we're from. <laughs> really proud. Um, 31 wins. Seniors had 104 wins. And um, this team was a joy to be around, to coach. So proud. That was the message that, you know, we're disappointed, obviously, right now, uh, today. Uh, we certainly felt that we had an opportunity against a great team in Oklahoma. Uh, but overall, taking a step back, just so proud. This team this year, 31 wins, continue to hold the head up, our heads up. Um, it was a great, great season. Now Q30 Sports basketball analyst John Alba joins us to discuss the women's basketball team season, season ending game against Oklahoma, and a look ahead to next year. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay, John. Oklahoma jumped out to a quick 16-3 lead. Did the fast start attribute to Oklahoma's play, or was it Quinnipiac coming out of the gate slow? Yeah, Victoria, I don't think Quinnipiac was expecting that pace of play out of the Sooners right from the get-go. See, these two teams on paper looked awfully similar. A lot of depth, teams that like to shoot, but within three minutes this game almost seemed out of reach for Quinnipiac. Now it did get to within 11 but a costly turnover by Adeline Martucci did end things for Quinnipiac. I gotta say though Kalon Williams three minutes in the first half eight points already off the bat. Gabby Ortiz phenomenal as well in the first half. It wasn't that Quinnipiac played a bad game. Oklahoma was just way ahead of the pace. Well John it's needless to say that the senior class has been the best in Trisha Fabry's 20 years here at Quinnipiac. Jasmine Martin has been a very special member of that class. What's the legacy that she leaves behind? She's a model for consistency, Mark. 12.8 points per game averaged over the course of her career. But she's been a gamer, and that's not something that you can put in a stat column. It's something that you're born with. When Jasmine Martin struggled in the regular season, she didn't get any MAC honors. She wasn't on the first team, second team, or even the third team. 
She said, okay, I'll turn that into a MAC tournament MVP trophy. She carried that out of Albany and into the NCAA tournament where with 24 points, including a three from San Francisco to end her career, she proved that not only was she the best player in the postseason for the Bobcats, but she may be Quinnipiac's best player of all time. Trisha Fabry has now made two NCAA tournament appearances in her past four years. Do you see her getting offers from big schools and even leaving Quinnipiac to coach somewhere else? There's a lot of things you have to think about if you're going to leave a job that you feel comfortable with. 20 seasons for Trisha Fabry, 325 career wins. She was hired the same day as C. Vivian Stringer with Rutgers, the same year at least. That's something you have to take into consideration, Victoria. Now, you can look back at what happened with Tony Bazella two years ago in the MAC, leaving Iona despite never making an NCAA tournament, winning a regular season title, a postseason title, ends up going to Seton Hall, and he gets Seton Hall to the NCAA tournament. Could Trisha Fabry be tempted to go that way? Maybe. She also has her daughter, Car daughter Carly, rather, uh, on the team, so that has to be something she'll think about. I don't think she ends up going anywhere. Maybe once Carly's gone, but. She's got everything made right now. Four consecutive postseason tournaments. Why would you want to leave something like that? Mm -hmm. John, thanks so much. We are now joined by Quinnipiac women's basketball guard Jasmine Martin. Jasmine, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. So you talked a lot during the post game after the game against Oklahoma mm -hmm. about how good the Sooners were. Now they had, were the best you had seen since Notre Dame. What was it like facing them? Um, it was very similar to Notre Dame, obviously not as good, but the speed of the game was just something we hadn't seen um, since November, and it was something that we had to adjust to quickly. You know, they got off to that really great start, but once we adjusted to it, we were able to stay in the game as far as points, but we were just that far behind, we couldn't catch up. So, Jazz, obviously Notre Dame and Oklahoma, two of the best programs in the country, especially Notre Dame, some of the best competition that Quinnipiac has ever faced. Mm -hmm. How does that impact the program going forward, having faced competition like that? Um, I think it just sets a new bar, sets a new standard for Quinnipiac basketball. I think when we look back 10 years from now, we want to see the program at higher levels and be able to say, look, that's what we started 10 years ago when we're, you know, 30 with kids and just looking back on, you know, the legacy that we were able to leave and start here at Quinnipiac. Your coach, Trisha Fabry, was named MAC Coach of the Year. Mm -hmm. What does she mean to this program? She's the reason why we are where we are today. She did a great job recruiting our class and all the girls to follow. And I think just the program she's been able to put together over these last four years is something that she's going to be able to look back on when she's far, you know, in her future and away from Quinnipiac and be able to really look back and take in what she's been able to do with the program, taking it from D2 to Division One to a top mid-major program. All right, Jazz, I got to put you on the spot here. You were Sitting over here during John's analyst segment, you heard him say that he thinks that you might be the best player in Quinnipiac women's basketball history. What do you say to that? That's a great honor and something that is really nice to hear, um, especially from somebody who I look very highly to. Um, you know, it's just something that I've worked very hard for, and I've always wor worked worried about um, the process and not the end result. And, you know, I had a slow start to the season, but it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So... I just wanted to leave my mark and leave my legacy. So, Thanks so much, Thank Jasmine. You, Jazz. Thank you. Uh, when we come back, we will be discussing the men's hockey team and what its future will look like after falling to Harvard 5-2 to two in the ECAC semifinals. Plus, we'll be breaking down the NCAA tournament bracket and more after the break. Stay with us. We are your source for entertainment news. I could really go for a rain mic sub right now. 
come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken and cheese for just over $4. Giant cheesesteak subs and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as $4.75. QCash accepted just a mile down the road on Whitney here at Ray and Mike's. Thanks for sticking with us and welcome back to Sports Pause. It was a big weekend for the men's side of the ECAC as Quinnipiac, St. Lawrence, Colgate, and Harvard battled in Lake Placid, New York for the conference crown. Top seeded QU faced six seeded Harvard on Friday afternoon in a semifinal matchup. Let's see how it went down. Quinnipiac, Harvard, ECAC semifinals, the famous Herb Brooks Arena in Lake Placid, New York. Bobcats looking to get back to the finals for the first time since 07. Leading scorer Jimmy Vesey in the house for Harvard. Bobcats looking to contain him. Spoiler alert, they won't. Here he is right off the bat. 30 seconds in. Banks went off of Michael Gartig from a sharp angle try. Not sure how it went in, but it did. And just like that, it's 1-0 Harvard. A few minutes later, Colin Blackwell at the top of the near side circle with a blast right over Gartig's shoulder. 2-0 Crimson. But they're not done yet. Still in the first. Looking to take a more commanding lead. They do. It's Tyler Moy, a defenseman acting like a forward. Walks in alone. Draws a penalty and still finds a way to put it home. Three to nothing, the Crimson lead. Second period we go now, Crimson on the power play, but the Bobcats starting to push back. They were a much better team here as Justin Agosta forces a turnover, drops it for Alex Barron. Back to Travis St. Dennis, who initially misses, but follows up the rebound and puts it in on a backhand. Quinnipiac looking to chip away a little more. Steve Michaelik, Harvard's goalie, chips it along the boards. Matt Pekka picks it up for Soren Janssen. Michaelik not really paying attention, and Janssen blasts it past him. And the Bobcats cut the lead to one. Third period we go now. Quinnipiac in the offensive zone. They're going to draw a penalty here as Moy's going to knock St. Dennis to the ice. He's going to get a roughing call here. Take a look at the replay in slow motion. That'll put Quinnipiac on the power play and a chance for them to tie the game. And they would have their opportunities. It was Travis St. Dennis with a one-timer blast that went wide and eventually gets cleared out of the zone as Pekka can't find St. Dennis once more. And that does it for the Bobcats power play. Michael Garty would be pulled with about two minutes to go. And it just wouldn't work out for the Bobcats as the Crimson grab the loose puck. And that nation's leading goal scorer again, Jimmy Vesey, puts in number 30 on the year. And just for good measure, Sean Malone gives another one. 5-2. Quinnipiac falls to Harvard. Here's Coach Pecknell to Matt Pecka after the game. We controlled our own destiny today, and, and we, didn't, we didn't handle it. So uh, we'll have to see how everything falls. I mean, I know there's, there's a million different scenarios, and there's different websites that cover what can happen and what can't happen. Um, you know, in the end, we'll have to we'll have to wait till Sunday and see how it all falls. There's not much we can do right now. We're a team that bounces back pretty well after after a tough loss. So if we do get the opportunity, and obviously it'll it'll take some some teams to win and some teams to lose for us to get in. And if we do get that chance, I think we'll be you know we'll be hungry as we've ever been. So. After calling the game with Marty Joseph on the Quinnipiac Bobcats Sports Network, Marty and I chatted for a few minutes about the struggles from the Bobcats and the Crimson success. Hello everyone and welcome to this Q30 Sports Rapid Reaction to Quinnipiac University's men's ice hockey team. 5-2 loss to the Harvard Crimson in the ECAC semifinals. Alongside Marty Joseph, I'm Mark Spillane. Marty, we just got done calling the game for the Quinnipiac Bobcats Sports Network. Bobcats tail two different teams. First period, they were terrible and they couldn't recover. Yeah, you had to, re you had to really believe that at some point the lack of good starts this season was going to finally come back to haunt them. And it did tonight. Bad first start. Jimmy Vesey gets the Crimson going just 30 seconds into the game. Really bad first period, outshot 14 to four. They got back in the game in the second. Good coaching job by Rand Pagnold, settling some of his players down, getting them rolling again. But in the end, missed opportunities, just too little too late. So, talking about Harvard, they came out and just dominated. They used the big ice, the Olympic sheet, to their advantage. We thought Quinnipiac would have a speed advantage, not the case. The Crimson dominated. Yeah, the top line, especially in the first couple of minutes, really set the tone of the game. Uh, they got two quick goals in the middle of the period as well in that first period that were from other lines, but the pace of the game was really dictated by that first line. Slowed up a little bit in the second with coaching adjustments by the Bobcats, but for the most part, that's going to be the line to look out for tomorrow night, regardless of what team behind us plays them. Uh, they really dictated the play, set the tone. And I'm telling you, that's that Jimmy Vesey is, is one heck of a player. Two, goal, two more goals tonight. He's the reason they're back playing the way they're playing in the first half of the season. Nation's leading goal scorer for a reason. Talking about leading goal scorers, Quinnipiac Sam Manis was out. What kind of impact did not having him make? It was tough. I mean, they, they, they worked around it for the most part, but you could tell 
on top of the ejection of Tim Clifton. They just ran out of gas at the end. They had some opportunities to tie it. They had some opportunities to maybe even take a lead with some chances too in that second period. Uh, you had the Connor Clifton goal that whatever you want to call it, whether or not it got called back, but for the most part, he would have been a key piece out there, especially late in the game, uh, trying to get that game knotted up at three. One last thing, looking forward, Quinnipiac no longer a lock to make the NCAA tournament. They dropped to 15 in the pairwise after the loss. The, the game that's about to start behind us will have a big impact on whether or not they'll make it. There's Hockey East games that'll have a big impact, Big Ten games that'll have a big impact. Quinnipiac right on the bubble. Yeah, they're going to need a lot of help. I mean, the good thing is that they have Minnesota and BU to help them. Those are two really good teams that if they win those conferences, they're already shoe wins regardless if they win or not. So if they get if they get the two wins, that'll help them out along with a few other wins. It's really a, it's really a mix up of who's going to win the, the remaining three teams left in this conference. Either way, it, it doesn't it, it's going to be a real shakeup. And I I gotta believe they they still have enough to get in, but right now they're right on that. The men's hockey team will be traveling to the Midwest next weekend as it will face overall number two seed, North Dakota. The Bobcats will travel as the four seed in the West region to Shields Arena in Fargo, North Dakota to face the region's top seed. The arena is located about one hour south of North Dakota's campus. The puck will drop at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. It will mark the first time the two schools have faced off since 2006. Rob Siamber joined me earlier in the week to discuss the West region and the 2015 tournament as a whole. Let's check it out. Hello everyone and welcome to this Q30 Sports special presentation alongside Rob Siambra. I'm Mark Spillane. Rob and I are here to chat a little bit about the 2015 NCAA Men's Ice Hockey Division I tournament and the bracket that was just selected by the selection committee on Sunday. And Quinnipiac will head out to the West Regional to Fargo, North Dakota. And they're going to have to take on the home team in that regional, the University of North Dakota, in Game 1 on Friday night at 8 o'clock. Rob. Tough draw for Quinnipiac. Yeah, definitely. You know, a lot of people expected them to head out to Manchester, even Providence, but that loss to Harvard on Friday in the ECAC semifinal really didn't help them out. They had to rely on other teams to win. They're still in the tournament. It was pretty much guaranteed for them after that, but still, they got a long ride ahead of them out to Fargo, and it's going to be tough since there's right, they're right in North Dakota's backyard. They're the 14 overall seed in the tournament. They're the number four seed in the West Regional, and the, the two seed would be Michigan Tech and the three seed. St. Cloud State. So those other three teams, all teams that have had very successful years, you mentioned the loss to Harvard. That's what kicked Quinnipiac out west. That allowed Yale to jump over Quinnipiac, so they get to stay east. They'll head to Manchester, New Hampshire as the four seed there. Well, they'll take on Boston University. And then Providence College will stay in Providence, and that has caused a lot of controversy over in the East Regional. Yeah, it definitely has, Mark. I mean, talk about uh, bracket integrity and all the seeding here. Providence gets to stay basically in their backyard as well. You know, Quinnipiac played in Providence a couple of years ago, played in Bridgeport last year. And everyone, you know, like I said before, they were expected to at least stay east, whether it was Manchester or Providence. But as announced today, that just wasn't the case. Well, something you said before we, we came on the cameras here is that if Quinnipiac actually shows up against North Dakota, it could be a good game. I mean, it really wouldn't be surprising for QU to come out and have a really nice game and potentially win. It, it would be pretty much classic Quinnipiac to have a nice bounce back game. Usually after they struggle, they're very good at rebounding and doing a nice job. But like we said, North Dakota, a real tough draw. But you were saying it, they play 60 minutes, they can beat anybody. Yeah, definitely. North Dakota's lost their previous two games as well, including the Constellation game and the NCHC. But so it's gonna be interesting to see both these teams, how they react to losses like that. Um, you know, the Bobcats, like you said, Mark, it's the past few games, it's been that first period, you know, the rest of the games that they've played in, you know, the second and third period has been pretty good. That second period against Harvard on Friday, mm -hmm. one of the best periods of hockey. I've seen the Bobcats play a shorthanded goal. Soren Janssen taking advantage of Steve Michaelik's sort of a lackadaisical play in the corner, you know, takes advantage of it. The Bobcats were right back in that game. You know, the score was 5-2, to two, but those were two uh, empty net goals for Harvard. That game in reality is a 3-2 to two game. So definitely it's going to be exciting to watch that game. The Bobcats held a media session at 1 p.m. on Monday to, to discuss the upcoming West Regional. Q30 Sports was on the scene and has more from Rand Pecknold, Matt Pekka, and Danny Federico. If you look over the last 10 seasons, last 15, last 20 years, um, you know, that's, that's one of the best three or four or five programs in the NCAA. You know, year in, year out, um, they're dominant. Um, they put a lot of guys in the NHL. Um, I think they have 14 draft picks right now. Uh, and not only do they have draft picks, but they've got first rounders. And there's a big difference between a first rounder and a seventh rounder. You know, like getting first rounders to go to college is, is really difficult to do. And they've got high seconds and thirds. And, um, so it's, it's an awesome challenge for us. It's a unique opportunity to have to go play them uh, in, a, in a hostile environment, which really is a home game for them. Uh, but we're excited about it. We look forward to the challenge. And, 
and uh, I think we'll play well Friday night. You no, know, it's not good. I mean, he he didn't even bring his equipment within the Lake Placid this past week. He didn't practice. It wasn't even you know he's not even close. So, you know, we're going to proceed ahead without without him, um, and and we need to find a way. You know, North Dakota's got an injury. They lost a good player. Uh, St. Cloud on Friday beat North Dakota. St. Cloud had two of their best players out of the lineup. It's, you know, I've said before, we don't make excuses. You have injuries, you need to deal with it. It's part of college hockey. It's part of the NHL. It's part of hockey. Um, and, um, like, you can't make excuses. You just, guys have to step up and we have to move on. And would we like to have Sam in the lineup? Absolutely. He's, he's one of the best players in the country. And, and are we a different team without him? Yes. Um, but we don't have him. So we need to find a way. Just as we lost Taze for a while earlier in the year, I thought he's one of the best in the league. And, and our record was pretty good when Devon was out of the lineup. We had guys step up for him. When we found out we were playing North Dakota, I didn't, I didn't know much about them, um, like systematically wise or you know details. But we just got to watch a lot of film, and I think more so it's about playing our game. And if we we come out the way we're capable of um, and dictate play, we should we should be good. It's definitely uncharted territory, I guess you could say. It's gonna, it's almost going to be a home game for them. It's right in their backyard, and they have a great fan base. So. Um, Atmosphere is going to be great, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun playing against a team we've never never played before, two teams that don't really know each other. So it's definitely going to be a great experience and, and definitely a good test for both teams. It's not easy getting in the tournament. Um, like obviously this year we had to we basically had to wait for teams to to win and to get us, and obviously we put ourselves in a pretty good position to, to get in the tournament. But um, it's it's a very difficult tournament to win, and I think uh, one thing that we've been talking about is that getting in getting in is the hardest part. Um, it's not uncommon that lower seeds have gone the distance obviously Yale did it a couple years ago so um, we're just you know keeping the boys optimistic and and excited to get going because you know it's, it's obviously it's going to be a battle but we, we definitely think we can win. Coming up after the break Mark and I will be handing out report cards to the most important player on each winter sports team and we'll be checking out the men's lacrosse game over the weekend. We'll be talking about all this and more when we come back. Looking for debate and analysis of your favorite Quinnipiac sports? So attacking and pressing. I mean, right, and, it's not and what they're doing isn't working. But unfortunately, they couldn't finish the Colgate game, so I think definitely those are the keys that the Bobcats need to watch. Had guys that can take the ball in the in, in the latter stages of the second half. I think those Even are the limited in, in, the minutes. in the MAC, they play the run and gun style. Q30's and QBSN's Bobcat Breakdown brings all that to you and more. Live every Monday night at 8.30, tune in to see analysis of your Bobcats from the week before. Every sport, from every season, it's all right here on Bobcat Breakdown. Looking for debate and analysis of your favorite Quinnipiac sports? So attacking and pressing. I mean, right, and, it's not, and what they're doing isn't working. But unfortunately, they couldn't finish the Colgate game, so I think definitely those are the keys that the Bobcats need to watch. Had guys that can take the ball in the, in, in the latter stages of the second half. I think those Even are with in, limited in the, minutes. In the MAC, they play the run and gun style. Q30's and QBSN's Bobcat Breakdown brings all that to you and more. Live every Monday night at 8.30, tune in to see analysis of your Bobcats from the week before. Every sport, from every season, it's all right here on Bobcat Break. That was then, this is now. Don't be just a number. Hello, welcome to Chameleon. At Chameleon Hair Color Cafe and Spa, it's all about what makes you feel beautiful. Their professional team is dedicated to helping you reach your customized beauty goals from your head to your toes. Chameleon Hair Color Cafe and Spa, where it's all about what makes you feel beautiful. Welcome to A Sheer Sensation, North Haven's premier cosmetology service, located at 140 Washington Avenue, minutes from Hamden. We offer an array of services, from basic cuts and colors to lash extensions and formaldehyde free keratin treatments. We also provide hair chalk and styling for men. When you spend $60, your cue card will get you 10% off. Call us at 203-239-6477 to make your next appointment at A Sheer Sensation. Welcome back to Sports Paws, 
we're going to be doing something a little different now and taking a look at some of the winter season's major athletes and their respective report cards. I'll take the first two, Victoria, and I'll start off with Chelsea Layden. The Quinnipiac women's ice hockey netminder earned an A- minus for her record-breaking season on the stat sheet. She posted a program and ECAC record with 16 shutouts. She also had a 9.33 save percentage and a goals against average of just 1.19. Layden's 25-9-2 record was the winningest season in QU goaltending history, and she was even named the ECAC Women's Hockey Student Athlete of the Year. On the hardwood, another senior shined at times in his final campaign and earned a B-plus for his performance. Quinnipiac guard Zaid Hurst had an incredible start to the season with 34 points and 11 rebounds versus Yale on opening night. He finished his year averaging just over 18 points and 6 rebounds per game in 30 contests, and his year-long contributions earned him first team All-Mac honors. Next up on our report card list is men's hockey forward Sam Annis. Many people were worried at the beginning of the season Annis would fall into a sophomore slump and not play as well as he did in his rookie season where he was named Rookie of the Year. Annis proved doubters wrong as he led the Bobcats with 40 points. His 23 goals is tied for 6th in the nation and 3rd in the ECAC. He was the top power play provider for the Bobcats, totaling 9 power play goals. He earned an A for his report card. Jasmine Martin of the Quinnipiac women's basketball team will round out our report card list for tonight. Martin averaged 12 points per game, which included a team-high 18 points in the Bobcats' 72-61 to win over Marist in the MAC championship. She also scored 48 points in 28 minutes in Quinnipiac's matchup against Oklahoma in the NCAA tournament. Martin improved her free throw shooting, but her three-point and field percentages dropped this season. For this, she earns a B-plus score in her report card. Women's hockey forward Erica Uden Johansson has been invited to participate in the Women's World Championship for Team Sweden starting March 28th. This is her second World Championship and fifth international tournament appearance, including two Olympics. Uden Johansson finished her se senior season at Quinnipiac with 10 goals and 15 assists for 25 points and totaled 96 points in her Quinnipiac career. Now switching gears from winter to spring sports, we move to the lacrosse field. The Bobcats men's lacrosse team hosted the Detroit Mercy Titans last Saturday and looked to even their conference record at 1-1. One one. The men's lacrosse team recorded its second win of the season and first conference win on Saturday against Detroit. The Bobcats squeak, squeaked out a 13-12 victory against the Titans in what turned out to be a nail-biting game. Quinnipiac led in shots 43-26 as goaltender Colin Nesdale had 11 saves in the game to seal the victory. Ryan Keenan led the Bobcats on offense with four goals and one assist in the snowy contest. On the baseball diamond, Quinnipiac picked up its first two wins of the season by taking two out of three versus St. Peter's. Thomas Jenkins tossed seven shutout innings with six strikeouts to earn a win in game one of Sunday's doubleheader. The Peacocks then won, this, won by scoring five runs in the bottom of the sixth inning to race a 4-0 Q lead in game two of the doubleheader. The Bobcats then took the series with a 3-1 victory on Monday, and they'll be back on the field at Central Connecticut State on Tuesday. Well, that's all the time we have on Sports Pause today, but we'll be back again next week, same time and same place. For more from Q30 Sports, follow us on Twitter at Q30 Sports, and check us out on our website at Q30Television.com. For Victoria Rotigliano and our entire production team, I'm Mark Spillane. Thank you for watching. Good night, everyone.